For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. And the fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the city's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. In the early 19th century, London was a dangerous place to live. From this crowded metropolis came some of the most notorious and intriguing murder cases. In the years of the early 19th century, there was a lot of concern about crime, including Spencer Percival being assassinated. People generally were not safe from highway robbers, whether they were the prime minister or anybody else. Many of these killings captured the public's imagination and inspired the country's greatest writers and artists. These murders also contributed to a significant change in policing. The law had traditionally been enforced by parish constables or watchmen. People didn't want to be an unpaid policeman, which is what the constables and watchmen were. They'd call out the time, they'd look out for fires, and they were meant to keep law and order. The formation of the Metropolitan Police would establish the modern force which is still active today. But it wasn't just the threat of murder or violence that frightened the people. Disease was everywhere. A cholera epidemic had raged across London in the summer of 1849. Over 14,000 people were killed. The big problem here was the Thames by this time was an open sewer. It was said it took 30 tides to float a dead dog out of London. Londoners put all their sewage into the Thames, uh, the tide went out, the sewage came back. The Thames was also their drinking water. The residents of Bermondsey in southeast London had to suffer the tides of sewage that collected on the banks of the Thames. The leather trade dominated the local economy and the stink of its tanneries hung over the closely packed houses. For tanning, you needed lots of urine. And so you had urine being collected and put in great vats for, for, the, for the tanning process. So this didn't actually sort of help the odors of Bermondsey. But for one man, it wasn't disease that was lurking for him in the homes and streets of London. Murder was afoot, and like so many murders, this one was to begin with a torrid affair. Marie de Roux was born in Lausanne, Switzerland. She moved to England and acquired a taste for the higher things in life when she went into service as femme de chambre to Lady Evelyn Blantyre. Her employment was at one of the grandest homes in London, Stafford House. Their things were marble and silver, and the dinners they had, the dances, incroyable. I had dresses, for the opera, for travel. We were in France many, many times. I never imagined I would see things such as this.
That was before I was married. Get in along. In spite of his suspected criminal background, they were wed at St. James Church, Piccadilly, in 1847. It's thought that Fred managed to seduce Marie by saying that he was going to inherit a great deal of property from his mother. The deception was to prove a critical part of this marriage. Marie had had a relationship with Patrick O'Connor before she was married, and they remained close. Patrick O'Connor was a 50-year-old, quite wealthy man who took a shine to Maria de Roux. I have to get back to the office. The relationship between the three seems to have been a sort of a casual menage a trois. O'Connor obviously did have money. And um, this, I think, well, almost certainly, this was the attraction for Mrs. Manning. This tryst was soon to prove deadly. It was Mr. Walsh. Who persuaded him to pay? Well, I know the man a little. It is so fortunate you join us then, to celebrate. So unexpected. Patrick O'Connor was supposed to turn up at the Manning's household alone, but he was unable to shake off his friend, Pierce Walsh. Patrick O'Connor still had affection for Maria and would visit. Quite what those visits consisted of, we shall never know. He thought if he left it long enough, I'd forget. But I've every shilling in my book and every penny of interest. Sorry, Fred. All this money talk must be boring you. I'll take a glass while you're there. They say it helps keep off the cholera. Then my husband will be the last to get it. <laughs> <laughs> a proper man's drink. Your health? <coughs> Mr. O'Connor. I'm fine. It's the pipe smoke, probably. Maybe a glass of water, will that help? Ooh. Mr. Walsh, can you help my husband? I think that we all need water. <laughs> as long as he doesn't choke on that too. <laughs> <coughs> Where were you? How does he drink so much of that? Four hours I have been sitting here with him, waiting, waiting. Maria. No. I said six. I couldn't get rid of him. Everything was ready. I know. I'm sorry. I said six. I'll come tomorrow. I promise. Only you? Just me. Promise. Tell no one. I think that most men do not have the courage. Or if they have the courage, they do not have the intelligence. On the 8th of August, 1849, things had not gone to plan. But the following night, things would be very different. A shocking murder was about to take place that would fascinate press and public alike. A desperate manhunt would be conducted on both land and sea 
to capture the culprits. The notorious tale of the Bermondsey horror was about to unfold. Lady's maid when I met Patrick. He said my accent reminded him of Madame Celeste. Yes? The actress. I do not know. He was tall. That was before I met Frederick. Patrick O'Connor came from County Tipperary in Ireland. He'd found his way to London in order to make his fortune, and it's thought that he first met Marie when she was on a trip to Europe with her mistress. It's understood. He was very annoyed that she accepted Frederick's proposal before he had a chance to make his own. Rather oddly, the three of them remained in contact after the marriage. On the 8th of August, 1849, Marie Manning had lain in wait in the home she shared with her alcoholic husband, Frederick. But the plan had been thwarted by the unexpected arrival of Pierce Walsh. The very next night, Patrick O'Connor, with whom Marie Manning was still having an affair, made his way to the house alone. the devil in? Emptying his pockets on cheap brandy. What became known as the Bermondsey Horror was actually the murder of Patrick O'Connor. He was brutally bludgeoned, presumably by Frederick uh, Manning. I mean, he was hit some, something like 17 times. Patrick O'Connor met a grisly end. The Mannings buried him under the flagstone floor of their kitchen at number three Miniver Place, and he would remain there.
it would be a while before anyone was aware of the death of Patrick O'Connor. In the meantime, Marie and Frederick Manning had to set their plans in motion. They had a lot to do if they were to profit from this murder. I went to his lodgings. His landlady, she doesn't like me there. But if Mr. O'Connor wants it, what can she do? Shares of the railway. The Mannings had what they wanted. Railway shares, much like these. Patrick O'Connor was a very wealthy man, having done exceedingly well as a moneylender. But the Mannings needed to act soon because people would inevitably notice the disappearance of a well-known figure like Patrick O'Connor. And what is it you say to them? That I've got some shares I'm wanting to sell. What shares? Eastern? Eastern County's consolidated stock. 20 shares, 120 pounds. Well, and what is your name? Patrick O'Connor. Patrick O'Connor went missing on an evening when he'd been invited to dine at the Mannings. And when he didn't turn up for work, people got concerned, started to make inquiries. All this activity and Patrick O'Connor's disappearance obviously caught a few people's attention. In a time of rampant cholera, sudden death was commonplace, but sudden disappearance means people will start looking for you. I saw Mr. O'Connor leave with you, but since. So he didn't come for dinner on Thursday? No. Just I spoke to some of his colleagues down at the docks, and O'Connor told them he was on his way here. They saw him on London Bridge. He said he was on his way. He didn't come. No. But we invited him, yes, uh, for dinner, but he did not. Nobody's seen him since. It would only be a matter of time before the Mannings fell under suspicion. But in the meantime, it would require quite an effort on the part of the new London police force to unravel the mystery of what happened at number three men of the place, Bermondsey, and even more to track down the perpetrators and bring them to justice. It would become known as the Bermondsey Horror. Marie and Frederick Manning had murdered Patrick O'Connor 
and buried him under the flagstones of their kitchen. Marie had stolen O'Connor's railway shares and intended to cash in on their devious plan. But Pierce Walsh and others were still looking for O'Connor. The Mannings were running out of time. They were also suspicious of each other and on the verge of an ill-timed marital breakup. Furniture dealer? Yes. But I'm only just back. Say to him we sell everything. Everything? Patrick, he told people he was coming here. They will come. They will find him. That was all I kept from my work for Lady Blantyre. I never wore it. When was I able to wear it with Frederick? I was taking what I was promised. Marie? I spoke with Bainbridge. Fifteen shillings deposit. The rest when he comes round tomorrow. Marie? Marie Manning was gone, and Frederick Manning would soon be gone too. They were both now on their own, and the police would have to use all their ingenuity, as well as the latest technology, to track them down and bring them to justice. The Metropolitan Police was only 20 years old at this point. There'd been a real need to create it in dangerous early 19th century London. Well, before 1829, when the Metropolitan Police first started patrolling the streets of London, the system was organised by local parishes. People didn't want to be an unpaid policeman. So what was approved was the hiring of substitutes. Now, the easiest substitutes to be hired were the old age pensioners. Some of them were infirm and decrepit and couldn't really do the job that was required for controlling crime in London of, of those years. So this led to a growing dependence upon the rope as a solution to crime. In the reign of Henry VIII, the death penalty is in for about 25 offences. By the time Dickens is a boy, it's in for over 200. You could be hanged for murder, you could be hanged for writing on Westminster Bridge. You could be hanged for stealing, you could be hanged for impersonating a pensioner. Age was no limit. As late as 1830, uh, a boy of nine was sentenced to be hanged for setting fire to a house. London had been rocked by the Ratcliffe Highway murders, in which two families were attacked, leaving seven people dead. They arrested John Williams, who actually committed suicide in prison. And then the Home Secretary ordered that his dead body should be displayed on a cart and there was this great procession that went through Wapping and then they buried um, this John Williams with a stake through his heart. The city suffered terrible crimes but remained without an adequate law enforcement agency. This problem was addressed by Robert Peel 
Home Secretary, in 1829, he brought in the Metropolitan Police Act, which created the world's first modern police force. Of course, once it had gone through, all hell broke loose because people did not want a police force. And so when the first policemen went out on the streets at the end of 1829, they were stoned, they were held down in the road while coaches and horses were driven over them, they were beaten up, there were cases of men being blinded. Even though it was only two decades old by the time of the Mannings murder, the force had already dealt with several high-profile murder cases. Thomas Griffiths Wainwright, a case that was to prove a challenge for the new London police force. He was one of the city's earliest known serial murderers. Thomas Wainwright ended up taking up life assurance policies and then poisoning his wife, his sister-in-law, and, and so on. The evidence against him could only be proved against one of, one of the victims, and he, instead of going to the gallows, as was confidently expected, he went to, uh, he, he was transported to uh, Australia, and he died there some years later. His life story was to prove intriguing to some of the nation's greatest writers. Oscar Wilde was inspired to write pen, pencil, and poison after hearing his story, and we think it's Wainwright who was referenced by Arthur Conan Doyle in his Sherlock Holmes case, The Adventure of the Illustrious Client. Another high-profile case, Lord William Russell, a long-time member of parliament, had been murdered in his sleep by having his throat slashed. Courvoisier had only been employed by him as a valet for about five weeks, and during that time he'd already stolen some silver plate which he'd deposited with a friend. But Courvoisier thought he was going to be dismissed, and it's at this point he goes to the kitchen, takes a knife and cuts Russell Russell's throat. The police were able to deduce that a robbery had been faked. There was no trace of any external burglary or breaking of any sort. It was actually that thorough search of the crime scene that provided the evidence that lent, led to Courvoisier's arrest. Courvoisier was hanged outside Newgate Prison in front of a crowd of 40,000 people. Charles Dickens was one of them, as was William Makepeace Thackeray. And they were both appalled by what they saw. Thackeray even wrote an essay entitled On Going to See a Man Hang. In it, he said, I feel myself ashamed and degraded at the brutal curiosity that took me to that spot. Charles Dickens would soon have another murder case grab his attention as the police were closing in on the mysterious disappearance of Patrick O'Connor in the summer of 1849. Thanks to the suspicions of his friends, such as Pierce Walsh, the authorities were now actively searching for Mr. O'Connor, and his last known location was three Minima Place, Bermondsey. The kitchen floor was very neat. It had just been freshly whitened. Two police officers who had the key from the landlord noticed that a couple of the flagstones had damp edges. So he put his pen knife there and it was soft. So they heaved up the flagstones, dug down deeper, and then they found a toe. Um, they realized that they probably found Patrick O'Connor. Patrick O'Connor had been buried face down, naked, with his feet tied back to his thighs, his body was covered in quicklime. Stupidly, when they were put, after they put quicklime on the body to destroy it, they left his false teeth in, which led to his identification by the dentist. Actually, that was a sort of milestone, if you like, in identification. This was now a murder investigation, and the hunt for the killers was on. A £100 reward had been issued by the Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, for the apprehension of the suspects, but it was police ingenuity that led to the capture of Marie Manning rather than a mob in search of a big payday. 
Scotland Yard were brought in and the new detective branch started inquiries. There'd been some luggage with a lady answering Manning's description that had gone up to Edinburgh. Mrs Smith? Yes? There's two gentlemen here to see you. They used the new telegraph system to contact the Edinburgh police, traced Manning, brought her back to London. It was the telegraph also that led to the capture of Frederick Manning when a report came in on the wire that he'd been spotted on a steamer heading for the Channel Islands. It turned out he spent most of his time there in hiding. Police! Get down on the floor, Frederick! Get down on the floor! Frederick Manning, you are under arrest for the murder of Patrick O'Connor! The morbid tale of the Mannings electrified the public. It was dubbed the Bermondsey Horror. The Times even reported that she was reading their report of the crime when the messenger of justice interrupted her studies. The Mannings had nowhere to hide. They didn't even have each other anymore, given how their relationship had soured. In their trial at the Old Bailey, they would mount their own separate defences, and Marie would become furious. No! With the way she was treated. I will not stand it! But it's hard to argue against a dead body being found under your kitchen floor. On the 9th of August, 1849, Patrick O'Connor, an Irishman, had been murdered at three men of a place in Bermondsey. His sudden disappearance had not gone unnoticed, and a week later, the police discovered his body buried under the kitchen floor. A nationwide hunt was launched for his killers who had fled in opposite directions. Marie Manning was attempting to start a new life in Edinburgh, Scotland, while Frederick Manning was in hiding on the Isle of Jersey. Both were swiftly captured and locked up in Newgate Prison, facing the charge of murder. The Manning's trial at the Old Bailey was the talk of the town. It seemed everyone had an opinion about the Bermondsey horror. Frederick Manning's defense was simple. He wanted to exploit the intense negative press surrounding Marie Manning to his own advantage and blame the whole thing on her. She was, after all, the foreigner in the midst. My hypothesis might, at first sight, appear shocking and unmanly. We're all in the habit of associating the female character with mildness and obedience, and the male character with power and strength. This rule is not a universal one, however. History teaches us that the female is capable of reaching higher in point of virtue than the male. But when she descends to vice, she sinks far lower than our sex. My hypothesis then is that the female defendant, Manning, premeditated, planned, and concocted the murder and made her husband her dupe an instrument for that purpose.
Marie's defense, on the other hand, suggested that she hadn't been at the scene of the crime at all and only became involved in the cover-up and the theft. I don't think there was any particular reason to think that they weren't acting in concert together and they both escaped together even though they escaped in different directions. I can't believe that he wouldn't have that he would have had the courage to do it on his own. I think he would have had I think she was the driving force there. Marie refused to look at her husband during the trial and testified that O'Connor was more to me than my husband and that he'd been killed by Fred in a jealous rage. But it was Marie who invited the victim to dinner, and it was she who'd taken delivery of a new shovel on the very day of the murder. Could it have been fear for her own life in the face of a violent, jealous, dangerous man that made her steal the victim's money? Could it be that same fear that made her flee to Scotland? I think it was almost inevitable that they would be found guilty. I mean, they had the railway shares, and the body was found under the flags in, her, in their kitchen. In those days, trials at the Old Bailey were very short. Um, they took place very, very quickly. Um, certainly in the 18th century, the average Old Bailey trial lasted about 10 minutes. Um, a jury would be sworn in for the day and would deal with several cases. So uh, looking back, the the criminal justice system seems a bit rough and ready by today's standards, but by the standards of the day, they would have been regarded as fairly convicted, I'm sure. The jury took just 45 minutes to reach their verdict. Frederick George Manning and Maria Manning, you have been convicted of the crime of murder. No! I will not stand it! You are to be ashamed of yourselves. There is no law, no justice here. You have been defended by able counsel. They called no witness. Every topic that their ingenuity and experience taught them has been urged in your defense. You have been found guilty upon evidence that clearly leaves no room for rational doubt in the mind of any human being who has heard the evidence. There is but one sentence open to me consistent with justice, that you be taken hence to Her Majesty's jail in the county of Surrey and thence to the place of execution, severally to be hung by the neck until you be dead. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Desirous truth in the inward parts, and in this hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with his up, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be wiser than snow. For the penny press and the public, this was to be one of the greatest crime sensations of the century. It had all the ingredients necessary to satisfy a prurient public. Sexual intrigue, a vicious murder, a pretty foreign villainess, a desperate manhunt. It fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories. Mannings were hanged on the roof of Horsemonger Lane Jail before a crowd that some people said was 50,000 strong.
Charles Dickens watched the execution from the window of a rented room in a nearby house. He attended the, the public execution of the Mannings by Horsemonger Lane Jail and felt very disturbed by the, the way that the crowd reacted. He was a famous author by this time and he decided to use his fame to highlight the barbarity on show by writing a letter to the Times. Sir, I was a witness of the execution at Horsemonger Lane this morning. I believe that a sight so inconceivably awful as the wickedness and levity of the immense crowd collected at that execution this morning could be imagined by no man. The horrors of the gibbet and of the crime which brought the wretched murderers to it faded in my mind before the atrocious bearing, looks and language of the assembled spectators. I do not believe that any community can prosper where such a scene of horror and demoralization as was enacted this morning outside Horsemonger Lane Jail is presented at the very doors of good citizens and is passed by unknown or forgotten. Public executions were um, part of London life and drew enormous crowds, particularly for controversial murders. Dickens is critical of the Manning's execution, but he's not against hanging, he's against public hangings. Charles Dickens may have been rightly appalled by the spectacle of the Manning's execution, but he was inspired to write one of his greatest novels, Bleak House. The character of Hortense made to Lady Dedlock, whose tumultuous past drives much of the story, was based on Marie Manning. So that was the tale of the Bermondsey Horror, one of the most notorious murder cases of the 19th century. It wasn't only Charles Dickens who got caught up in the shocking story, the case continued to be discussed for many decades after the Manning's execution. In fact, it was widely believed that the black satin dress that Marie Manning wore for her public hanging led to the sudden unpopularity of that fabric and a new epithet for Marie, the woman who murdered black satin. <laughs> like so many stories associated with notorious murders, I think that one's a bit of an urban myth. But what is true is that this case enraptured the nation. The Bermondsey horror became a key tale in the story of London's dark side.